Welcome everyone to another Voices with Raveki. I've, I've, I've been so looking forward to this conversation, uh, this second part, and I don't think it'll be the terminal part at all. I, that's not what I want. Uh, of This ongoing uh, conversation that very often becomes a dialogos uh, between myself and Bishop Maximus. Um, in the previous <clears throat> episode, part one, I asked the bishop uh, to sort of develop an argument, an overarching argument, um about uh, what are the unique resources that eastern orthodoxy has in order to help people respond to the meaning crisis uh, and uh, why might that be the case and how might that be the case and he was very uh, carefully laying that out um he was making important comparisons uh between eastern orthodoxy and scholasticism um especially around um, the distinction within Eastern Orthodoxy between God's energies and God's essence and how that made available um, interpret a different kind of interpretation of possible relationship with God and the kind of, <clears throat> there's no word for it, no noun. I'll use the most neutral term I know in philosophy, the kind of entity that God is, but even that I have to do that with, um, and, and, and the consequences of that. Um, and, in, and, 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 and as part and as a well situated part of that argument, he was talking about the transfiguration of Neoplatonism within Christianity and how that contrasted with how it was taken up in scholasticism. And then there was some contrast also, especially around notions of participation and synergy with Protestantism. I found everything the bishop said to be a coherent, cogent argument. And that's and, and I also <laughs> recognized last time that we were not done the argument i don't even know if we, we were at the beginning of the end of the argument um but no. there's, <laughs> there's a lot um a lot to keep uh going and i and i want to keep it going and and so bishop um again um, welcome um uh, how how did you see the talk and is there anything you'd like to start with uh, uh before we we get back into the flow of the argument well, well, first of all, John, thank you so much for having me on your podcast. It's uh, really uh, an honor to be able to speak with you and uh, to be in this this forum with you. Uh, I um, I was really happy that we had the opportunity to speak last time. I, wa I was a little bit uh, dissatisfied with um, my explanations in that I thought I... Um, I didn't. I wasn't able to clarify some points um, to the extent that I would have liked, and I thought I jumped around a, a little bit. Um, I hope maybe in this conversation I can uh, structure what I'm going to say a, a little bit more coherently. Um, but the the topic of the conversation, uh, I think, is apart from being just interesting. Um, I think is is important, especially especially to help us understand the way that the modern world got to be the way that it is, mm. um, how we departed from traditional notions of understanding ourselves and our place in the world, and how this has contributed to the to the meaning crisis. Um, and how I, I think and I hope that um, Orthodox Christianity offers perhaps some, uh, well, as you said, resources to be able to uh, ad address this. Um, I'm, I'm not saying that we need to go back in time. That's unrealistic. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I do think that if we if we have the proper principles, um, and I do believe that the Orthodox Church offers us those principles, principles which have been ignored or sidelined um, in the intellectual tradition of the West over hundreds of years, um, I, I think that it can uh, be of great aid to uh, helping people either find meaning in their lives or for us to try to um, slow down, halt, reverse. I don't know how far we can go um, with the 
the chaos that we have in society, apart from the, um, you know, the, the fact of or the idea of, of belonging to the church and, and having that um, ultimately what we believe to be participation in God, which of course we consider to be the, the purpose of our lives. So um, I'm, I'm really thrilled to be able to speak with you about, the, about these topics, uh, which are so, so important. And um, how far we'll get in this particular conversation, I, I don't know, but I think any terrain that we cover is going to be positive. And um, if we can touch on maybe the, eventually, some of the points of contact be between uh, what I'm trying to elaborate of Orthodox theology uh, and your own work, um, which I think has tremendous value, um, I think this could be a, a really positive thing. So, so thank you very much, John, and I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Excellent. So, uh, towards the end, we were touching on a deep point. I found it very deep um, about these interconnected ideas of, and you allowed me to use all three of these terms. Um, um, and not that I need your permission, but you know what I mean. You 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 didn't find that it, that I was imposing, uh, mm -hmm. the, the, you know, participation, uh, synergy, interpenetration, um, and you you were starting. You were part of that was trying to indicate a different way in which Eastern Orthodoxy took up Neoplatonism, and you wanted to emphasize a distinction. Uh, I'll, I'll, if I get the words wrong, please correct me, but it was something like this. <clears throat> you see scholasticism taking up Neoplatonism. Um, with, with you, I share the, con I don't see the deep connections between Neoplatonism and Protestantism. Jordan uh, Cooper is trying to do that, and I'm going to, I'm talking with him, or we're going to actually record a video on him. I, I, I want to hear what, what that looks like, but I, I, I share, like, I don't see that, but <clears throat> and, and you know, I want to emphasize you. You're treating everybody with respect. There's no sense of antagonism. So I'm, I'm not here trying. I'm not here cheering. I'm here trying to explicate the distinctions I heard you making. So scholasticism sort of takes it up. That you said something along those lines. Protestantism mm -hmm. has a much more vague relationship with it. I think that's fair. Eastern Orthodoxy transfigures Neoplatonism, and that's that transfiguration that you think is a big part. I'm not saying you said it was all, but it's a big part of how there are unique resources within Eastern Orthodoxy for addressing uh, the meaning crisis. Is that fair so far? Very fair, yes. Okay. So I want to I want to pick that up. I want I want to ask you, given that framework, I, and you can return and develop those points a little bit more if you wish. If there's anything you want to go back and say, I want to get a little bit clear about that. I welcome you to do that. But I want you to take that as sort of where we got to, and then mm -hmm. continue to advance the argument, right, for the way in which Eastern Orthodoxy transfigured um, Neoplate Neoplatonism uh, and I, I, and, and I'm very open to something I'm going to say now. So I'm not, this is not a, a jujitsu move to, on you or anything like that. Yeah. I, there, I think, so I'll say what I think and why I'm saying it and then, but it's only to invite you. I think the integration if you'll allow me very broad things right now, between logos, right, the whole thing of intelligibility and everything in the Neoplatonic tradition, and agape um, in Christian Neoplatonism is, is good. <laughs> like, it gets close, it helps make us wiser, gets us more, better comported towards reality. Mm -hmm. I, I, I see Neoplatonism reaching towards it in the way they were trying to work with Eros and then Socratic Eros and Platonic Eros, and they're trying, but Christianity comes in and uh, makes this really. I mean, it's a. I mean, 
not only is it a theological statement, it's a philosophically profound statement that God is agape, right? Uh, which is one of the few bold identity statements made about. Now, I get it. That's not an exhaustive, uh, you know, logical identity or anything like that. But it is an identity statement, and therefore it deserves to be taken very seriously, I think. Uh, and, and so I see that. And so if if you could, as you're building the argument about the transfiguration of Neoplatonism, if you can say why you think this is an advance, um, and it, does it connect or is it convergent with the that point that I just made? Maybe it's different. Um, what's the connections? It, it, so my question is, it, can you? I have, I have two requests. Can you advance the argument on the transfiguration of Neoplatonism, and then? Can you put it into discussion with the point I just made about what I think is advantageous about Christian Neoplatonism over sort of new Platonism? Ne oh, sorry, standard, not new, not new Platonism, a standard sort of pagan Neoplatonism, classical Neoplatonism, if I can put it that way. Is is that a fair? Are those fair requests? They're they're very fair requests, John. Um, and um, well, if it. If I lose track of where I am, please remind me. Okay. Um, because I, I tend to do that. Um, you know, the, just just to make a very um, uh, initial statement uh, with regards to what you just just said. You know, the uh, obviously the idea of love uh, in in Christianity is it's probably the core idea idea of Christianity. Mm -hmm. You you could make you could make an argument for faith as being the core value, but I think I think the argument for love being the core value is is a little bit stronger. It's the, it's um, the greatest of these is love kind of argument, right? I mean, that is St. Paul. I, just, right. just, to, just to say that you're not alone in making that claim. Right. I mean, St. Paul says that these three remain faith, hope, and love, but greatest of all is love. Yeah. So, you know, that's a, um, if we're going to take the argument from authority, I think we have uh, pretty good argument right there. Um, so, so this idea that you said, you know, God is love, it's not just a philosophical idea. It's not just an identity statement, um, but it is a it is a practical guide for the way that we ought to be living our lives. Mm -hmm. And and that, of course, is the ideal of of the of the Christian to live a life of love. And you know it's repeated so many times in so many different ways in the Holy Scriptures. Um, you know, Bryce saying that the that the greatest commandment is thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy strength and with all thy mind, and thou and love thy neighbor as thyself. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, in these are all the lay, all the the law and the prophets. And um, I mean, I don't, I don't have to go through all the scriptural verses that that talk about this uh, in the most superlative terms. Uh, so, so yes, you know what what the ancient Greek philosophers were exploring a little bit with the idea of eros. Um, I think you could say fi finds its its um, completion in or full expression in the Christian idea of, of agape, of, of love, and of um, uh, both, both love for God, which we can understand in, you know, a very broad sense, and did, did I? Oh, your, your camera just, video just disappeared. Why did my video just disappear? Um, I got to pause us here. Uh, yes, ap apologize for that little blip. Um, uh, so, so yes, there is this there is this fullness of of love, and and then some of the fathers of the church, like Saint Maximus, for example, actually did try to tie it into the uh, to the idea of eros. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, Saint Maximus talks about the you know he actually uses the word. Um, maniacos, maniacal love, maniacal eros. Oh, picking up on Plato, right? Yeah, right. yeah. Um, but it, you know, it's this idea of 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 ecstatic love, the idea of 
yep. um, you know, something that's so intense and so beyond, let's say, the humdrum of normal human experience that it can only be expressed in these these superlative terms, which 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 almost sound, um, you know, ridiculous or or offensive, um, but but which in fact express uh, something which is in experience, which which is um, transcendent. To use, I, I use the word transcendent um, because it's a very broad word and it yeah. covers a lot of ground. Um, and a lot. Uh, so if I if in the course of this conversation I say transcendent multiple times, it's it's because I'm trying to refer to something um, beyond. The reality that that we commonly experience, but without specifying exactly, yeah, what point? Because we can specify it in different terms, and obviously different religious traditions um, specify it in different ways. And uh, you also use the word transcendent, if if I'm if yes. I'm not mistaken. I do. Um, and and I'm, you know, when I use that word, I'm not excluding what what you are meaning by that word as, as well, even though I'm probably even though I'm probably referring to something more as well. Sure. I, I mean, um, um, I, I take it. Well, I want to I want to ask a question, but I'll just preface it by saying it's ecstatic standing beyond yourself. You're drawn beyond yourself. But um, but I, I mean, I think the thing about love is also that it's not alien from us. It's not transcendence in the sense that it's, you know, that it's taking us, you know, it's disconnecting us from ourself or something like that. What I mean is love is also powerfully imminent, um, if I can put it that way too, right? or else it's not love. Um, it, it, there's the ecstasis, but the ecstasis is, is one that draws you. It, it doesn't just uh, point beyond you is, is what I'm, I'm trying to say. Uh, and, and you're nodding, so I, I think you're agreeing. So that leads me to a question and, and, and you, you helped afford the question. Uh, by, by by talking about um, Saint Maximus uh, and the use of uh, uh, maniacal love, um, ecstatic. Let's call it ecstatic. That way, we won't get into too much uh, confusion uh, or. But you can, you can, you can have lots of fun if you say maniacal love. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, you can. Um, so I take it that ecstatic agapic love is something that is proper to human beings. Like, uh, I don't hear you making the exclusivity argument. Now, you can be making an exclusive argument about a kind of fullness, and I'll, I'm not denying that. But I don't hear you saying, and only Christians experience agape or experience ecstatic love. That seems to me like a, you're not saying that. So, so uh, No, I'm not, I'm not saying that. Good, good. So is although, although I would I would affirm that Christianity is the religion which most highlights that idea. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I know, think uh, agapic love. Yes, I, I think um, I think the uh, I, I think that's one of the great strengths of Christianity. I think there's a similar emphasis on karuna and compassion in Buddhism um, that's also prioritizes it. But I, I'm not going to challenge the, the 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 claim you just made i, th I think um and, and that's what i was trying to get out with the identity statement that's not just an identity statement that god is agape right yeah and uh okay so but does that mean that agape and in and its deep interpenetration with logos <clears throat> which i hear to be part of this whole Christian Neoplatonic tradition. <clears throat> is that, and, and I don't want to draw you into weird heresies or anything, but I'm trying, I'm trying to get at, I'm trying to avoid a Minos paradox, which is if there's nothing in us that can recognize what's real, what's true or good or beautiful, then we can't possibly learn it. Like, <clears throat> right? Is it, is it, is it, is it the way in which and I'm agape and logos, and I mean by that that whole thing we've been talking about, right? Not just logic, but that whole capacity for 
for proper ratio religio in relationship to what is true, good, and beautiful. And the idea is that the love for what's true and good and beautiful is most properly an agapic love. And, and let me let me try and be very clear what I mean. We don't love it instrumentally. We we don't love it. Right. We want it to exist, even if we if, even if we do not exist. We want right. We want truth, goodness, and beauty to it. it therefore, it is properly uh, uh, um, an anchor for meaning in life. Because meaning in life is to love something that to be connected to something that has a value and an existence beyond your own egocentric value and existence. The love of a mother of a love for their child as a prototypical non-controversial example, right? And Jesus uses that, so I'm not imposing anything either. Um, <clears throat> so is it our agopic, I'm gonna make a word here, logostic as opposed to logical, right? Because logical isn't the word I wanna use. Is it, is it, is our, is our inclina our normative inclination, our, our sense that we can be called agopically to care about truth, goodness, and beauty for its own sake and find it meaningful in the sense of meaning in life, not just semantic meaningful. Is that, is that the capacity in us to recognize or receive? I, 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 I'm, I'm unhappy with this sentence, God, but that's what I'm trying to get at. Like, it, 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 I'm trying to, I'm trying to get because we stand beyond ourselves. We're called beyond ourselves, right? Uh, but as I said, no, we're no, not. No, no. I think I think I know where you're going, and I think I have. Uh, okay, um, oh, stop. You you pick it up then. You pick I, it up. I don't want to. I, I don't want to say I have the answer, but um, I I think there is an uh an idea prominent in the fathers of the. Orthodox Church that talks about something along the lines of what you're saying. Ah. Um, okay, and so that's the idea of noose. Yes, yes. We were talking about this last time, and that was a point we ended on. So this is great. Pick this up, please, Bishop. Okay, so, so the fathers of the church make a distinction between logos and noose. Yes. Um, and it's a it's a a very important distinction a very prominent distinction and saint maximus talk uh, well uh, many many of the fathers talk about it but saint, saint maximus for example states that they ought not to be in opposition to each other but rather they ought to be in in union with each other um and that this, this is an example of a dyad saint maximus talks a lot about dyads and the the unity of dyads and the um, the proper relationship between dyads, which is the the Chalcedonian model, in other words, the union of the two natures in Christ. Mm. Um, the all right. So so when the fathers talk about nous, obviously logos, I don't have to unpack that too much because that's something you're you're very familiar with. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, logos. Of course, logos. In, in Greek has many has many meanings. It's a very broad term. It can it can refer to. I mean, literally it means word. Um, it can mean by extension communication. It, it means reason, uh, in the sense of the human mind rationality. Uh, it can also mean principle or reason. Reason in the sense of of why reason in the sense of cause. Yep. Yep. Um, so so it has these broad meanings, and you know when when the when ancient Greek authors used the word logos, and when the fathers of the church who were also writing in Greek used the word logos, um, you know there there's always this enormous subcontext with yep. the with, with the word. Um, all right, so so we have logos on the on the one hand, and in this particular context, we're we're referring to reason, human reason, yeah. but we also have, have nous. Now, nous is often translated by the word mind in English. Yeah, it is. It's, it's off. It's also translated by the word intellect. If you read a lot of uh, yeah. orthodox texts, for example, the the standard translation of the Philokalia in, in English translates nous nous by intellect. Uh, which I th I think is really misleading. It is tremendously. Um, I agree with you. 
And I, I think really the, the best word in English to, to capture um, the largest part of the semantic range of the word noose, and obviously wor words in different languages have yep. different semantic ranges. Totally. And this, and this is a huge issue with translation. Um, but I think the word really in English that, that captures this is consciousness. Hmm. Um, that's, that's, that's much closer to what Nus is referring to in Greek texts. Could I, could I ask a question here? Because there's, yes. two, I, I, and I like this, but there's two different senses. There's a, there's a, of consciousness and they're very important right now. Um, um, I, I, I and I, I'm offering the distinction as a way of helping you to clarify. There's consciousness as the possession of qualia, the blueness of blue, the greenness of green. There's all that. That's sort of the nature of consciousness. It centers around the heart problem. Um, but there's also consciousness in the functional sense, which is, you know, consciousness is what we bring into when we're confronting very complex situations uh, with a lot of ill-definedness, a lot of novelty, and its main function well, you know, I was going to argue this, is, is this kind of, you know, uh, this very sophisticated, higher order kind of relevance realization. Uh, so the, 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 the verb that comes closest, which is often a translation of, new, of the verb noesis, is noticing. It's our capacity to notice, right? So I'm taught consciousness in that functional sense of to notice, to size up, to, to, to zero in on, to direct attention, to refine awareness. I take it you're using consciousness more in that sense than I want to talk about qualia here or subjectivity or something like that, because I don't think those are actually proper uh, to at least the the Greek Neoplatonists. Is that fair or am I? Am I... That, that, yeah, yes, and to extend what you just said, um, the fathers of the church often connect it explicitly with attention. Yes, yes. With attention. Yeah, yeah. So that, that yeah, um, and that sense, I well, think particular, particularly in in prayer, yes. Um, so I, I mean, I mean, obviously, the, when when the fathers of the church you talk about these these topics, it, it's not a an abstract philosophical conversation. It's no. it's meant <clears throat> it's meant to be an explanation of of very practical things, um, especially something like prayer. So. So to kind of tie this back into the original point, um, the, the fathers of the church say that the, the faculty that we use primarily, uh, I don't want to say exclusively, but primarily in prayer is the noose. Right. That makes perfect um, sense to me. That makes perfect right. sense. Um, and also the faculty by which we perceive divine things is the noose. Is this and related to that noose is also, I mean, this is clearly the case in the Neoplatonic tradition. Uh, it's related to your ability to, to grasp a whole, like to, 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 to see all at once the oneness, uh, the gestalt, uh, because that, that's- it, I, 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 believe, I believe that that's so. Uh, I mean, obviously the fathers don't use the word gestalt. But, no, 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 of course, but, they're not German. <laughs> but, 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 but I believe, I believe, I believe that to be so um, in, in my understanding, my reading, my reading yeah, of the fathers. Okay. Yeah. So, so the idea is, is the following, that it is the, that human beings, the human soul has the faculty of noose, um, that that faculty is the is the faculty by which we we pray, um, by which we understand things in a in a non rational way, right. um, in a way that is distinct from logos, which is logic, and which is going to be in some sense more linked to propositional right right, uh, right. propositional thought. Yeah. Noose is going to be understand. In in other senses, in the in the perspectival and and in the uh, participatory. Right. So, 
so that um, it, when it's, a person it's, it's actually uh, uh, sorry for interrupting, but I really want to get really careful. I hope I hope you're not finding it disjointing. Uh, mm -hmm. So is, is news the proper? You know, is it the proper? nexus, I don't know what quite to say, the, the a proper aligning and mutual affording a perspectival and participatory knowing? Is, is that also, I know that the church fathers are not saying this, I'm, not, I'm asking you, because we're talking about translation here, right? That's what we're right, really- right. Yes, right, yes. Right. And so it, it, is it, 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 that's what I'm hearing you say. I'm hearing you say, no, no, I'm not, I'm, what I'm really talking about is that, that thing that we exemplify and because consciousness does that. Consciousness is very much What's at work in perspectival knowing? Clearly, I mean, it's states of consciousness. But consciousness, insofar as it affords self-consciousness, is also bound up with our sense of identity, our, our selfhood, our personhood, our participation. And so is it not, therefore, noose also a place the, 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 that mediates, binds together, co-activates, uh, helps to afford the cooperation of perspectival and participatory knowing? Is that fair? That I think that I think that's fair. Um, so so Saint Gregory Palamas says that the that the noose is the faculty by which we perceive divine things and by which um, divine grace in whatever form that might come, but more more particularly the the higher levels. Uh, for example, the um, the vision of the uncreated light that is a, 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 a big theme in Orthodox thought um, that this is this is the faculty which has the capacity so to speak yeah. to be elevated up to divine things that's right um, so so what that means is that um, to backtrack a little bit um, yeah. we were talking about agapi um the what that means is that something like agapi which is going to be the expression of agapi is going to be um mediated through the through the noose because we're not simply talking oh. about an emotion we're not no 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 but we're talking about a deep kind of attention caring but also binding of the self yes. right so right. that's that perspectival and participatory exactly. integration exactly. coming in Oh, this is brilliant. So I just want to make sure I get so yes. And so agape is the most fullest expression of that, that that integration of the perspectival and the participatory, the attention and the transformation of identity and the binding of identity. I, 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 is that is that correct? Yes. And, and hello? Yes. Okay, so you um I have a slightly unstable internet connection. I apologize. Um, so, so, so we can see here a connection between agapi and, for example, attention. Yes. I mean, yeah. you, you can't, you, you know, agapi is going to be, is going to be expressed through attention towards something. So, so what that means is that since noose is a natural quality or faculty of the human person, Yes. That means that those things which pertain to the noose or or functions of the noose are all also going to be natural. For example, agapi, and um, that on the one hand it is natural, yes, but on the other hand it can also be elevated. And right, we, but right. we believe that the elevation itself. But the elevation by which I mean, you know, divine grace, um, you know, you can think of that however you like to think yeah. about it, but um, the that that divine grace, that the advent of divine grace and the the to use the word that we used before, the the interpenetration of divine grace within the human person, yeah. um, which is mediated through the faculty of the news that this is not an unnatural state for human beings rather yeah. it is the most natural state for human beings that, right. that this is how we we really ought to be and that when we are not in this state we are deficient that this is a deficient state 
So, so that first of all was a very good answer. Now, can I can just you you made a good argument about the the deep relationship between noose and agape, but I I would argue I have argued right, and if I've understood noose correctly, that noose also it has a profound connection to logos. That without our capacity for noose, for noticing, for sizing up, for paying attention properly, like relevance realization, etc., then logos is also not available to us. And I'm wondering, therefore, do, does noose therefore also is there a way in which noose helps to explain the binding together of agape and logos? Um, is that, or am I stretching here? But, but I mean, um, no, no, no. Well, I think it has to be that way. Okay. I, I don't see. I don't see how it could be. How it could be otherwise. Right. Um, you know, uh, Saint Gregory of Nyssa yeah. uh, <clears throat> talks talks about noose. He was one of the first fathers who who spoke extensively about the noose, and and he actually says that it's it's the noose which is really what distinguishes human beings from animals. Right. Right. Now right. you know because no, normally the normal argument that it's the logos that distinguish human beings from, yeah. from animals, you know, you know, Aristotle's definition of um, yeah. man is a is a rational mortal animal. Right. Um, so, and, and I'm not saying that that argument isn't found in the fathers, um, but but Saint Gregory of Nyssa does does make this really interesting and I think useful. Uh, argument that that it's more the news which distinguishes the human the human being yeah and yeah. um i yeah. i would i would actually venture to say um maybe i'm stepping out of bounds here um out of the bounds of my my knowledge um that that this actually might be relevant to modern conversations about artificial intelligence yes i, I think it is and i think this is convergent with arguments i've been making about uh recursive relevance realization and you know the nature of insight and and, and um and, and you know the, and the kinds of insights that are transformative and that they they allow people to like to step beyond themselves there's an ecstatic dimension it's not just an insight into this problem but right it, it's like the way a child is moving through stages of development is that kind of systematic and systemic insight uh um so I, I I think it does. I think that's an important uh, connection. Um, in fact, uh, I think the fact that the current, I was just watching a video today about AI. I think the current model of attention, sorry, the current model of intelligence deeply influenced explicitly in the video, by the way, by Hume, makes this, that intelligence is completely sort of instrumental um, and it has nothing to do with how we're caring. And for me, I think that's a fundamental mistake um, uh, because I think attention is always, and I think this is a point that Heidegger really brought to the fore and has been picked up by 40 Cog's eye. Attention is always an act of caring. It's right, because you're fundamentally caring about this information rather than that information because you're caring about this situation because you're caring about you and the other people that are in the situation, right? That, 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 that framework of care it, it, you can't if you take it away you don't have attention right uh and so uh i think um what what you're doing like i think that's proper that the the and if they want to reserve the word intelligence then for just you know optimizing your ability to achieve a goal and it has nothing to do with caring then i can explicitly say that is disconnected from the entire socratic platonic tradition of reason as most properly what you care about i mean socratic rationality is ultimately what do you most care about and why and are you caring in a way that's yeah. consistent and makes sense um and so i think you're dead on i think that there's a big lacuna in uh that's why in fact i i've sort of given up the battle of trying to uh um change <clears throat> the word intelligence I, I just say intelligence is relevance realization but whenever it's recursive and trying to, and it has to be bound up with autopoiesis, and on the, I build away from that. Um, so, but I, I, sorry, I, I, you 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 put your finger on a point that I'm, I'm making a lot of 
it's deeply convergent with a lot of arguments I'm making. So, uh, mm. per, yeah, uh, if you are stepping beyond your bound of knowledge, it, it was a very, it was a very well placed step to, to my mind. I think, I think there's a lot of good argument for what you just said. Okay, um, great. Uh, do you want to do you want to go back to um, the original uh, topic we were we were discussing about the the transformation of you know, well, first of all, I want I want to regather because I think I, I think the the transfiguration again. I, I I'm going to hold you to that word because you 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 specified it. I, and, I, yeah. I I I used it and I know it's a bold word. Uh, but um, but but it's bold for a reason. You're trying to mm -hmm. you are properly trying for. I don't mean trying in the inept sense. You're 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 aptly trying to bring a precision, and, and so I, I want to respect that. So part, clearly not the part of that is well, you've got this recognition in Neoplatonism of a deep connection between logos and eros, and then eros has to be something than the standard Greek notion. It's reaching, and then Christianity comes up with a very bold claim about agape. Um, and then you made this excellent argument that agape and nous are very connected, and uh, nous and logos are distinct, and nous and logos, though, are also deeply connected. And that's how you can see all of these things being deeply integrated together. And you don't have that developed. There are precursors, and I don't think you deny this, in Neoplatonism, but this has been brought to a kind of clarity and coherence in, the, in Christian Neoplatonism, especially... Uh, in Eastern Orthodoxy that you don't see in classical Neoplatonism. Is that a fair summary of where we got to so far? Um, <clears throat> yes. But your um, hesitance. There's something you want to add to it. Go ahead, please. Well, well, it's. I mean, it's a fair summary of what we just just talked about. Yeah. Um, al although it's, I think, by no means exhaustive. Of no, what, I prefaced it by saying it is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Please continue then. Okay, so 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 basically, the what I was trying to say last time we spoke is that um, there there are maybe I I would say three main points of divergence. Pro probably there's more. Certainly there's more, but but there's three that are that are salient to me. Um, these three points would be would be rationalism. Yes metaphysics or theology they kind of get mixed up together when we're talking about these things yes um especially in, especially in neoplatonism because neoplatonist metaphysics is is theology yeah, the elements of theology um, by proclus right um and the question of intellectualism yes yeah. the okay so so those those three points i think are central and the I think that that in those three points, uh, Neoplatonism was deficient. Um, that it was it was groping towards solutions to these three problems. Right. Uh, but but didn't quite get there. Didn't quite get to the to the solution. Um, that that these issues were taken up in Christianity by the. Um, well, first by the fathers of the church, and and then later on in the West by the scholastics. Although with the intermediary of Saint Augustine, who was uh, crucial to the development of Western thought, and that um, I I believe uh, that the that in the Orthodox Church, or rather in the yeah. in the Eastern Patristic tradition, that these three. That these three issues were addressed in a um, in a more satisfactory manner, and in a manner which which um, uh, well, I say tra transfigures the, the the conversation. Whereas in the West, in scholasticism, these issues were also taken up, um, and um, you know to. To some extent, I think there was some positive work that was done, mm -hmm. but uh, I think it was insufficient, and I think that it, it got derailed a little bit. So could you say the three again? There's rationalism, 
So uh, rationalism, metaphysics, metaphysics and, slash and theology, and intellectualism. Right, right. Okay, okay. So which one would you like to tackle first? Uh, because well, uh, which, well, whichever. Well, sure. <clears throat> okay, so so rationalism. Um, you know, if 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 you read modern Orthodox theologians. Um, one of the one of the accusations that they will make against scholasticism or the Roman Catholic Church is is that is that of excessive rationalism mm -hmm. um, as compared to orthodoxy and patristic thought. Could you define how and, you're using the term? Just okay, to... I'm yeah, I'm going to define it. And I'm sorry, and, sorry. It is, and it is and it is spe spe and that rationalism is explicitly connected with the rationalism of ancient Greek philosophy. Right, okay, okay. Okay, so if you think about philosophy as a project, um, it's, it is fundamentally a rationalist project in the sense that, that it involves the application of human logic to, yeah. to the world that we find ourselves in, in an attempt to sort it out and try to figure out what's going on. The, I'm not saying it's exclusively rationalistic by 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 any means yeah. um because um you know i think i think uh actually in that connection to be fair the the work of pierre Hado is yes. uh tremendously yeah. tremendously yeah. insightful yeah um and um you know re really needs to be at the core of of modern and analysis of ancient greek philosophy i totally agree i totally agree with that um, so I'm not I'm not trying to downplay that part by any means. Okay. Um, okay. But nevertheless, the the ancient Greek philosophy is a rationalist program. Yeah. You know, and and you can see that very easily. You know, you read read Plato or Aristotle, and then read the Fathers of the Church. The the tone is completely different. What's going on is is different. It's a different yes. program. Yes. Yes. Um. You know. So, okay. So there's a this idea which we under, we try to understand things through human reason. Yes. Um, we and and in fact in Neoplatonism there is a program by which we do that, uh, specifically by the by learning how to think abstractly, um, by by learning to to abstract the the highest our highest values we and then understanding those abstractions to be the ideas the forms mm -hmm. um and then and then well and then trying to participate in them there's now now to be fair to neoplatonism and in particular to plotinus because mm -hmm. um I, I really think plotinus uh drew this out much better than any of the other Neoplatonists. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, there was a recognition that the highest point is beyond reason. Yes. In other words, the one. Yes. Um, and that was stated explicitly. Uh, so, you know, and, and, I, the, I, and, the, and the binding to it is not a process of uh, of, uh, of of discor of discursive reason. It's it's a it's a it's a it, the, the, he he tends to you use love more th than any kind of dianoia, uh, discursive reasoning for talking about that that realization of. That's why I tend to use the word realization rather than re reasoning about the realization, and it captures that sense of insight and all at onceness, etc. All right, <clears throat> um, but but there's but there are some problems that are you know, there is first of all the problem is. Well, if your if your program is that of rationalism, what do you do when you get to the non-rational? Yes. Um, it's 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 a problem because your whole program has been has been rational, and you know later Neoplatonists tried to tried to sort that out, um, and they came up with you know with different ideas that were, um, you know, from our point of view sometimes absurd, you know, like um, 
astrology, you know, Por Por Porfiry talks a lot about astrology as a means to ascend to the, to the divine. Of course, we've got Yamblikos talking about theurgy, which is, you know, practically indistinguishable from magic. Um, you know, so 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 the the, the mechanism was um, was confused, and um, you know, in 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 a way, almost almost self contradictory because because there was they didn't have the internal resources to resolve the problem of what how do you deal with the non rational when your program to reach the rational, the non-rational is rational itself. And so when that was taken, that was taken up by um, scholasticism and scholasticism did resolve it in a certain, certain way, but the way they resolved it was downwards. In other words, by downplaying the non-rational aspect. Mm. So, um, you know, so that's why we see in that in scholasticism, God is understood to be intelligible. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, this the, the and and God is understood to be an essence. You know, the perfect, absolute, absolute, self-existing essence. Mm -hmm. So, so, so in this sense, from the from the orthodox point of view, scholasticism actually is actually is worse than than Neoplatonism. Um, <laughs> um, well, 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 because, because Neoplatonism was, was striving towards this idea and ha had this idea that there, there was something yeah. non-rational, absolutely, absolutely beyond. Would you, would you, um, would you, your, your, your camera's gone again. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I think it's just your signal. You're coming back. No, you know, you know what it was. I just, I think I have a bad wire, and I just, um, I, I, I just want the wire. Could, could you give me two minutes? I'll pause it. Right. Um. So and and, and you know they. I don't, I don't know how far you want me to get into the internal contradictions of what Linus is. Um, well, well, can I ask you one thing then? Yeah. So uh, I, I'm following this argument. Um, uh, what about? I, I mean, there's arguments, and and they're and they're they're. I think they're, in terms of uh, academic, uh, you know, uh, stature. Uh, Gregory Shaw has you know, iamblichus, uh, uh, theurgy and the soul, on on iamblichus. Then he has other stuff where he says there's pl some pretty clear, like continuities between notions of theurgia especially as it's taken up into proclus and stuff you see in dionysus uh, i believe dionysus uses the word um but what you see and i'm not claiming he simply imported theurgia uh but that there's a relationship between uh, theurgia and liturgy in dionysus um and and so um i i guess i'm a little bit hesitant to say that theurgia is just indistinguishable from magic there's a deep attempt to distinguish theurgia from sorcery um, and there's an attempt to understand and as, as it goes on theurgia is becoming more and more like ritual um oh there's a person can't remember the title of the book it's uh theurgy the inv the invention of a uh, of a ritual tradition um mm -hmm. uh, and i i would have made an argument a little bit different uh, uh towards the effect that eastern orthodoxy uh, uh, sees an important role for ritual in enabling the noose to realize in a way that scholasticism doesn't. It sort of does philosophy here and ritual there. That's 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 an oversimplification, and I'm waving my hands to indicate that. Whereas I, I I'm doing. I, well, I I agree I agree with that 100. percent Okay, that was. I was going to get to that. I don't know. Oh, oh, go please go ahead there. Okay. Um, um, that being said, I don't have um. I I I don't have a very high opinion of theurgy, and I wouldn't want to, um, I wouldn't want to push the connection between theurgy and liturgy. Okay. Uh, 
anyways, that, that, that's a kind of separate discussion um, uh, that maybe we can put off for some other could, time. Well, or, or let me give you one, one way of maybe we could agree. Could you, I'm not asking you to agree with liturgy or, and I didn't want, and I wasn't identifying with liturgy. I wasn't saying that. Uh, but mm -hmm. what I'm saying is the, I mean, I want to say that that theurgy wasn't just the, like irrational magic. There was there there to use your term. There's a groping towards the importance of ritual uh, as as something that properly, um, I don't know what to say, engages the noose um, in a way in which discourse cannot. And, and that's what I that's what I see in that tradition. I and, and see. I'm very. I'm doing a lot of work now on. Um, you know what's called ritual knowing that there's a kind of knowing that is only available to us in ritual it can't be reduced to discourse it can't even be reduced to mythos it's 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 its own thing and this has to do with embodiment enactment etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, and that's that's um that's what i'm trying to trying to suggest to you so i, I didn't i wasn't i'm not asking you to advocate with the urgia that, that no i'm not saying that but I'm, tr I, 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 I'm trying to say, oh, you're gone again. Um, so, so <laughs> I, 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 again, I'm not trying to get you to assent to theurgy or anything like that. I'm just trying to, just like you can see the groping in Eros towards Agape, um, just like you can see that, I'm uh, the groping in, uh, in Neoplatonism of Eros to Agape. Um, I, I see, I see in the theurgic process some attempt to understand um, the role of ritual. Um, but I, I, is that enough of a connection point to get get you back into the discussion? Uh, is important in uh, at least to to the best of my understanding, and and you know maybe, maybe I'm misunderstanding theurgy, but uh yeah it seems to me that the, that the that the crucial difference is something like this that that theurgy is uh at least as explicated by Yamblikos, is a is almost a means of obligating the gods to to do something and it it is the medium by which it is done is the is the correct performance of certain rituals. Yes. And that correct that correct performance is key. And, yes. and so these these two aspects, on one hand, the correct performance, you know, the correct pronunciation of words and so forth. And on the other hand, the the basic the, the virtual obligation of gods, this is this is why theurgy seems to tend towards the idea of magic, even though they the theurgists denied that they were doing magic yeah um it on a functional level it's it it ends up being somewhat similar okay. whereas li liturgy liturgy or ritual in in christianity or in the orthodox church um has neither of those two aspects liturgy is uh, or ritual fundamentally are forms of symbolism. There are symbols that we act out that represent divine things that by acting them out, when we participate in symbols of divine things, it, it is a, a form of connecting with that divine yes. Yes. Um, in, in a manner that's not only intellectual, although, or, or rather noetic, um yes, no idea, yeah. but 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 even physical yes 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 um, yes yes and and if you, if you allow me to make this um kind of divergent or it's not divergent another point we can think of religion in the following way um obviously not the only way to think of religion but you know we if we if we want to look at it from the bottom up so to speak rather than from the top down um we we see the world that we live in. We see the world that we that in which we exist, and that there are things. Um, we in order to make sense of the world, we have to categorize those things. We have to organize those those things in our mind. 
um, that organization or that categorization ends up being universals. Um, or they are abstractions um, of, of a, a central idea, which is drawn from a multitude of particulars. So we go from the particular to the universal. Um, we can then even abstract abstractions in order to come to a, to, to a higher abstraction or a higher value. And then we take um, in, in religion, religious thought, um, we take those highest abstractions and we unite them. Um, and we unite them, we understand them to be, uh, to be real in, in some sense of, of the word real. We understand that a connection to those highest values and virtues and ideas which we have abstracted from lower, more concrete things, we understand them to be uh, the most important things which, which exist. And, and then in order to access them again, what we do is we reproduce them in the physical world as symbols. Right, right, yes. So, right, so, so the symbol is, um, is an expression of an abstraction or of a universal, but is an but is an expression on on the physical on the concrete level. Right, right. And and, and so within the sim within the symbol um, is contained the whole world of that particular uh, abstraction. And so it's kind of like this is a silly example. It's like a zip file. Yeah. No. No. Um, I get it. It's a good example. It's a good example. I yeah. like that. Um. You know, and so what what that does is that allows us to it allows us to access those those highest values and those abstractions in a manner which is not just intellectual. No, but I get it. Yeah, yeah. Physical, and and what that means to access those highest abstractions those highest values that's um you, you cut out for so a that's second. part of the value and that so you you're accessing them and it was garbled uh in a way that's not just noetic but physical is that what you said um I'm, uh, right i said so 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 since symbols are ultimately end up being physical i mean take iconography architecture yeah, yeah, yeah. music yeah. poetry um ceremony what whatever you want um it's it's all physical right yeah. but first something higher and so by in in that sense what it does is it, it allows access to the highest ideas not only to who are intellectual Truly inclined and who are um, able to think right, right, but, but to every general, because everybody can participate in the symbol. Yeah, by yeah. Particip participating in the symbol, they are those high realities. Yeah. Highest um okay yeah. we, we got, got a little off track and, and i'm sorry for the no 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 you're, you're you're not you're not off track it's that the signal's really breaking up but i got the idea that the, the ritual the symbol and i'm not i'm not really radically separating them because of the way it's physically enacted and embodied all right the, the ritual and the symbol makes available access connectedness to these higher realities uh, to people who are not necessarily coming at it in a you know in a highly intellectual way. So it it it, it broadens the access. Uh, it's non elitist in a powerful way, if I can put it that way. Is that I'm trying I'm 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 trying to uh, 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 make sure that I I understood you because it was quite garbled. But was that the gist of the argument you were making? 
That, that's the gist of the argument. Um, and I think, it, I think it's a really important point. Yeah, I think so too. I think it's very important. Um, okay, um, I, I, I'm going to suggest to you we stop fighting that this, that the signal is uh, not, not, not cleaning up. Um, we're at this really interesting point because I want to talk to you next time a lot about uh, ritual. And again, I see, and maybe you don't like this, but I see this is actually an extension of your transfiguration argument. Something like the attempt to get at ritual in Neoplatonism is being transfigured and improved and developed um, in this powerful way. And there's this important way in which the, everything you've been talking about with ritual and symbolism, the symbol on, the joining together, right, is so relevant to everything we were talking about last time about synergy, interpenetration, and deep participation. So I want to, maybe I'm going to invite you to come back and let's talk about uh, ritual and, and, and how you see it uh, working within the Eastern Orthodox tradition and why that can be a precious resource um, for addressing the meaning crisis. How, how, how about that for our next conversation? Okay, um, that you know that's a great great topic. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, we kind of missed some of the other some of the original topics uh, here, but uh, that's okay. You know, all the conversations are good. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, I I I don't want to. I sorry. We don't have to exclusively talk about that. I want to still talk about, I see it as a way of really deepening the first point about rationalism. And, and also, I think it overlaps with intellectualism. Um, very, and, very much so. Very right. Much so, yeah. and, and, but I also point out to you, I think you're making an ontological claim for symbolism that is very different from the sort of nominalist claim that symbols are just things that point, right? You are talking about symbols having a different ontology they participate that's what i'm hearing you saying so i think rituals actually tie into these three topics very well so we can do that and then we can return to the transfiguration in terms of rationalism intellectualism and metaphysics how about that i would just leave as a final note uh since we're talking about ritual and it's tie-in with um some of these questions of rationalism and intellectualism um the, the the very noticeable fact that the Orthodox Church places a high value on ritual. Yeah, very much, and that's definitely something I want to pick up on, uh, Bishop. I wish we we could continue, but I think it's for good practical reasons we stop now, uh, and then we pick it up again, and we'll go on to part three, and we'll pick it up around these three big themes, and but we'll start with ritual, and then get back into the three big theme, themes from that. Okay. So I, want to, I want to thank you for being here. We were fighting against technology, which uh, the, uh, my quote for that is technology is the God that limps, right? Um, it lets us down a lot. Um, and so um, we have to um, uh, bear with it, but we will definitely pick this up. I want to thank you again for this amazing conversation. And, and thank you so much, John, for, for having me on. It's uh, very much a privilege. And I thoroughly wherever the lobos might lead us yeah me too me too take good care bishop <laughs>